So the name Dogfish Head, um, Sam Calagione, the, the original brewer, the owner, the president, and the founder of Dogfish. He's a guy, he, was a, he grew up in Western Massachusetts, and um, just like folks say in Washington, D.C., we'll come over to Lewis, Rehoboth, Dewey for vacation. As a kid, he would go over to Maine, and he would go near Booth Bay Harbor, that area. There's a little rocky headland there called Dogfish Head. Well, his family had a little cottage up there, and that's where he would vacation and stay um, as a kid. So, you know, you're thinking about it, you're thinking, okay, here's this guy. He's um, opened a brewery in Delaware. He's named it after a place in Maine. So why is this guy in Delaware? Well, Sam went to a private, not, he was a day student at a private boarding school in uh, Massachusetts. Well, his wife, Mariah, she's from Delaware, here, about 10 minutes up the road, and she was a student at the boarding school as well. They met, one thing led to another, and you could say a woman brought Dogfish Head to, to Milton, Delaware. And um, in 1995, when he decided to open up Dogfish Head, he you know, looked around and said there's 11 states or so that didn't have a brewery. One of those states was Delaware. He takes all the money he can scrounge up at the time, goes down to what is our pub. He put all of his money into that place to get it going, except there was a problem. It was basically illegal to start brewing in the state of Delaware um, as a, a brew pub. So he had to go to Dover, our state capital, and literally write the books, per se, on, you know, wrote the laws for brewing in the state of Delaware. That's how he got the whole dogfish thing started. However, he didn't have much money, so he had to start somewhere so he bought a small system a little 10 gallon system that was really basically a bunch of kegs you can see that are kind of uh, retrofitted and created into a brew system and uh, started brewing on this um, his wife mariah was probably the best uh, new new bride new spouse in the world because she's a 25 year old guy and she essentially let him live at a bar he had a cot downstairs in the basement and he would wake up in the middle of the night start brewing beer brew beer two three times a day it would take him maybe six hours to make a batch of beer so two or three times a day he's brewing when he had downtime he was busting tables um, slinging beers across the bar making posters just put up to say come see me that kind of thing and it all started kind of really in this small little grassroots style movement on this little system um, so this is all reused dairy equipment that he got at auction and as the story goes he uh, brought some growlers of beer to the auction that day and said uh, you know handed out all the growlers got everyone you know a little bit buzzed and said look this is what I'm going to do with this equipment you know let me bid on it and you guys will be able to enjoy a little bit more beer and uh, that's what happened so he was able to get this stuff for a really good price at auction and then he was able to retrofit it obviously for the brew setup. All the brew pub beer gets pumped out of this system but this also functions as um, the R&D system for the big brewery up in Milton. So, you know, when Sam has an idea uh, for a beer that he wants to eventually do up there, you know, we'll come down here, we'll work on a recipe, get the, everything together, and we'll do one, two, maybe three or four test batches of certain beers, um, you know, instead of doing test panels. We have customers who tell us whether they like the beer or not, and, you know, we're getting direct feedback from uh, Dogfish fans on, you know, what they want, what they like, uh, what they don't like, it's immediate feedback on beers that we might release to the larger public. Now, some of our beers you guys probably have had, you probably have had 60 minute or 90 minute IPA. And does anybody know what the minute in that stands for? We have essentially the trademark on continually hopping our beers. And what happened was Sam said, I don't want to brew the same beer over and over and this and that, I want to do different things. So one day he was watching a cooking show and he saw this lady cooking and she said, okay, when you're making a pot of soup, if I spice it all at once, it's gonna cook off. If I spice it at the end, it's gonna to be too powerful. If I spice a little bit continuously throughout the cooking, it's gonna come out just right. He's like, what if I could do that with beer? So he got this idea where he took an electric football table, essentially a sheet of metal, about like that, looks like a football field. Um, perhaps uh, you may have had one. Some of the older folks will remember them, some of the younger probably don't. But he took that football table and he set it up on top of his brew kettle. And then he took a bucket, quite similar to this, put a bunch of holes in it, loaded that thing up with hops, punched a hole in the football table. And that football table, the way it would work is you would plug it in and it would vibrate and the football players would move around and do their thing. Really, they became a rugby match and just became a mass and didn't do anything. Well, he repurposed it, put a hole in it, plugged it in, and as it vibrated, the hops kind of fell out through the bucket fell onto the ta um, football table, and then they actually found their way to the hole, and they just kind of fell into the brew kettle a little bit at a time. And he did that for an hour and a half and continually hopped the beer. So 90 Minute was the first continually hopped beer we did. Once you started brewing on this, um, and you started doing that, you can imagine, you know, we had to grow out of this a little bit. So we built a 150 gallon system, a five barrel system down at the pub that's still behind the bar there. From here guys, grab your safety glasses, we're gonna roll into the brew house and uh, 
go check out how we make beer. What we've got is all up in this area here. This is the brew house that we currently have. And um, we can brew about 3,000 gallons of beer at a time, so about a 100 barrel system. So when, when you make beer, you've got uh, four main ingredients. You've got water, yeast, barley, and hops. So with the barley, we like to always have a couple examples for folks. This here is our base malt. You can see it's very light in color. It's also, um, this has got a lot of fermentable sugars. It's very sweet. If I was to throw this down, throw some milk on it, you can almost eat it like a cereal. This is actually a chocolate malt. You can see it's kind of been roasted a bit, a little darker in color. Still fairly sweet. Not as sweet as the base malt, but bringing in some other notes. You know, maybe hints of a little chocolate, maybe even a little toffee or such. And then this malt here has been roasted for quite a while. You can see it's very dark in color. Not, not very sweet at all, but lots of flavors going on. You've got chocolate, roasty coffee, um, toasty type of notes and things. And typically when you're making beer, you're gonna have a combination of barleys coming or malts coming together. So you might have, you know, say we're doing like a raisin, a mahogany, we might be blending a little bit of this and that and another malt. But when we're doing like a Palo Santo or an Indian brown that's very, you know, a lot darker, we we'll probably have a little bit more of, you know, some darker roast going on. And there's a whole bunch of different types of malts. Um, there's, you know, 15, 20 different ones that we probably use over the course of the year here in our beers and all. The other thing you're gonna have is hops. It's kind of like you just popped open a 60, you get that little whiff of hops going on. And we use, again, a, a lot of different types of hops. So what we'll go on in here is essentially outside are two giant silos, you can see. Those silos are filled up with that light color malt, that base malt. Uh, what's gonna happen is that malt's gonna be brought in and then you can actually hear it running through the uh, conveyor system and all here. And then say we were gonna grab an example of one of these type of malts here, a specialty malt. You know, the, the brewer's grabbing them by hand, throwing them into the hopper. They're gonna run in and you can hear that conveyor. What that's doing is taking it up an elevator and um, it's getting weighed so we have the appropriate amount and it's gonna run across above here's a little belt that runs on top of the roof and then it drops down right here into the, this is called the grist mill, or in this case, it's a, a wet mill. And what we're gonna do is take that for about 45 minutes, give or take, get that wet, get that oatmeal consistency, transfer it into the next vessel, which is this giant vessel here. You'll notice it's a bit larger than the mash tun. That's called the louder tun. We have a much larger louder tun than a lot of breweries because we use a lot of barley in our beer. Think of like a coffee, coffee maker at home. When you make coffee, Coffee will pack upon itself, hot water streams through, cools that, uh, all the flavor you want. You get that nice, you know, dark liquid there, that coffee wake you up in the morning, or maybe at the end of the, the night at the pub, you need a coffee to wake up to get back to the, you know, back home or whatever. So, same kind of thing, except instead of coffee, we're using that mash. The mash will pack upon itself, creating a natural sieve, water comes through, cools all the sweetness that we can get, and we're creating this essentially high-grade sugar water called wort, W-O-R-T. That's our basis for beer now. That's going to transfer into another vessel called the brew kettle. Before we get into the brewing though, just like at home, if you have coffee grinds and you put them outside, you know, in the flower bed or out in the compost pile, we're going to do the same thing with our spent mash. It's going to get pumped outside the building into a grain truck or a dump truck that sits out there and then farmers basically in southern Delaware, Sussex County, and even a little bit in the Merlin, We'll take that grain to different farmers and feed cattle. We also feed a few pigs and a few chickens on some other farms. And then they get a nice healthy source of food. We take a product that would go to the landfill and reuse it. And then we actually buy cattle back from one of the farms, in, uh, the bar farms in Lewis. And when you get a burger at the pub, you kind of think about the circle of life. You look at your pint, you look at your burger, and you figure it all out. Now, back to the brewing side. We've got wort. But then say we're gonna add our hops to the beer. Well, earlier we talked about, you know, continual hopping when we were looking at the vintage equipment and Sir Hops a lot, one of our early hopping devices. This is where we have a, a machine or a little vessel called the Sofa King Hoppy Machine. It's like sofa you lay down on, king wears a crown, hoppy machine. And that's what we add the hops to, and that's gonna add hops to the beer at the appropriate cycle and also the appropriate duration of time. Once we get done in the brew kettle, we're gonna then transfer that, not quite beer yet, because there's no alcohol in it, but essentially this high grade sugar water into the Whirlpool. And we're gonna take, spin that beer around, get some solids out of there. You don't wanna have a, a coffee grind if we're making chicory stout. You don't wanna have, uh, say, a little bit of uh, peach if we're making festina passion there. We're gonna get some of those solids, you know, as best we can out of there. 
And then we're gonna take that near boiling liquid and start to bring it down in temperature gradually to about 68 degrees by running it through a heat exchanger. The heat exchanger does a couple things. It gets that liquid down to 68 degrees, the fermenting temperature of ales, and then it also is saving a lot of energy in the process because hot water byproduct can come back and start over so we're not heating up from zero all day and wasting energy. So a lot of little nuances of you know, ways to save energy and try to do things sustainably, and uh, we're trying to incorporate them into the brewing process as much as possible. So what will happen is, in these tanks, we'll, put the, we'll introduce yeast into the process. Up until this point, we have a high-grade sugar water, and we don't have any alcohol going. So the yeast is introduced. It gets together with all those fermentable sugars, that sweetness in that um, wort, and starts to do two things, generate carbonation as well as alcohol. During this time, we'll be monitoring the process, the fermentation cycle, to ensure we're hitting you know, the alcohol levels we want, the flavor profile we want, and things like that. So we're gonna test the beer throughout this process, and every beer is a little different on how much time it spends in a tank. Some beer could be as little as maybe three weeks. Other beer could be spending you know, a month, month and a half, two months in a tank before it heads to the bottling line. Okay, in this area, basically what we have going on, empty glass over there, cartons and case boxes are here. Cartons and case boxes move down the line, empty glass moves down. It gets rinsed, sanitized, hits the filler, and gets capped. Once it goes through there, it's sticky because it's got beer all over it. It'll move down to a bottle washer. And then they head down, drop down in the four packs that are already in the cases, and then they come right down. You see these guys pull them off, fill them the pallets. From this point here, they'll head out to wholesalers, distributors, retail shops, etc., or down to the pub or the tasting room. So basically what we have going on here, this is our kegging line. Our kegs, we can do around 65 or so kegs in an hour, half barrels. Um, these are, you know, the six tools coming through now. Kegs will come through, they get cleaned up, filled, and uh, then basically they just make the turn and you see guys moving them off, building the pallets up and they'll head out the door from there. Some of our beers that go into the fermenters, which um, we saw all through the brewery and like on the outside of the brewery, the large tanks, instead of you know spending all their time in stainless, they're actually going to come and age on wood. So this tank here, this is a Palo Santo tank. This is a 10,000 gallon wooden tank. And Palo Santo translates to holy tree or holy wood. And it's a wood from Paraguay down in South America. So we make Palo Santo Marone, the holy tree brown ale. Um, it's a 12% unfiltered brown ale. It's aged on Palo. This here, the wood we use, it imparts a vanilla and a kind of a caramel note into the beer. So it's an unfiltered brown ale, very dark, almost leaning into the world of stouts as far as the, the uh, appearance of the beer. And a little bit sweet, but very roasty, chocolatey and such with hints of caramel and vanilla coming from this wood. But our mission, since our era of being the smallest brewery in the country to now we're the largest craft brewery in the Mid-Atlantic region, hasn't changed one iota. We're still all about off-centered ales for off-centered people, analog beer for the digital age, and asking people to step outside their comfort zone and try very unique beer. So at Dogfish Head, we're all about putting the where in Delaware and the mental and experimental. Cheers.